Bloody greetings, Slashaholics. Be sure to subscribe. Click that bell for notifications of all the slasher mayhem from the 80 Slasher Librarian. And be sure to click that like button. This upload is brought to you by the patrons of the 80 Slasher Librarian. That's Alleyway, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakins, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Elixir, Jay Gardner, Catherine McClear, Kristen Kay, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. If you would like to support this channel through Patreon, click the link in the description below. Depending on the tier you select, you'll get free ebooks, free merch, voice a character in an audiobook each month, appear on the podcast, early access content, and so much more. Tiers start as low as two to five dollars per month. Friday the thirteenth, the novelization of the film by Simon Hawk. Chapter one. Small towns don't change much over the years. If anything, they get even smaller. The children grow up and move away to bigger towns and bigger opportunities. Those few that stay behind replace the old folks as they died, providing not so much an infusion of fresh blood as a new dose of Geritol. Just a small shot of tonic to keep the old town going. Businesses closed, perhaps losing their customers to that new shopping mall in the next town, or simply finding they're unable to compete in an economy that is increasingly geared towards mass production and cheap foreign labor rather than quality and service. The regulars sit at the bar or at the soda fountain. Some still exist, and if you can find them, they're generally worth looking for, and they'll tell you tales of a time in the past. Days gone by. Remember when Al Cleary little girl ran off with that motorcycle gang back in 56? And when the police picked her up in, uh, where was it? Brattleboro, yeah. She'd come home with that tattoo. Damn, you could hear old Al scream clear over the county seat. Whatever happened to Bonnie clearly anyhow? Heard she went out to California, married some producer. What? Bonnie? Married a producer? Shoot, no kidding? Really? What I heard, of course, you know what they say, everyone out in California is a producer, right? She ever get any pictures? Knowing Bonnie, if she got into any pictures, they ain't the kinds you'd show your mother. Often, there were particular stories that were told over and over. Stories that became part of the folklore of the town, part of its history. In Crystal Lake, it was the story of Camp Blood. Camp Blood, as it came to be called, was the place on the outskirts of the town, about ten miles down the country road owned by the Christie family. For twenty-some-odd years, the story had survived, passed down orally like an Indian myth. It survived because it possessed all of the ingredients that made for a legend. It centered on a place, Camp Crystal Lake. Only the locals called it Camp Blood, and its focus was violent death and mystery. The mystery was that no one had ever learned who caused the deaths or why, and it concerned a local family, the Christies, who owned the place and tried to fight the legend to no avail. Ever since 1958, each time they tried to get the camp going again, something stopped them stopped them in a way that only added to the legend of Camp Blood. Some said it began in 1957, after that young boy had drowned. His name was Jason Voorhees, Pamela Voorhees' son. A shy child, quiet and strange, went swimming alone out in Crystal Lake. They never found his body. Others said it began in 58, when those two young camp counselors were killed. They found the horribly mutilated bodies in the barn, hacked to pieces. The girl who had found them, the murdered girl's bunkmate, had been taken to the county hospital in a state of nervous shock. Some claimed she got better. Others insisted that she was still in an institution somewhere, locked up in a padded cell and screaming about blood. The police had never solved the murders. Theories abounded, depending on who told the story. The murders were either committed by one of the other counselors in a jealous, homicidal rage, or an escaped inmate from an insane asylum, or by a satanic cult, or some deranged derelict living in the woods still on the loose, still out there somewhere. Or if you listen to Crazy Old Ralph, by vengeful ghosts, or ravaging demons, or by little green men from a UFO. The story varied according to how much Old Ralph had to drink. But then, nobody listened to Old Ralph anyhow. 
Old Ralph was the town drunk. No small town was complete without one. Big cities had them too, more than their share. But in big cities, drunks completely wandered the streets talking to themselves and carrying all of their belongings in shopping bags, sleeping in parks or down in the subways. They were ignored by a population that considered them a nuisance and didn't really want to see them, lest they feel some spark of human pity. People in small towns noticed. Maybe no one listened to them, but at least they noticed them, which made for some kind of human interaction. Old Ralph was happier in the town of Crystal Lake than he would have been in the big city. He had no friends except his imaginary ones and his long-suffering wife. But people noticed him and knew him. Every now and then, he'd get tanked up and hear the call. He would mount up his old swim newsboy special, the kind of bike you don't see anymore with sheet metal wrapped around the top frame rail so that it looks like it has a gas tank, the kind with the big balloon tires and springs under the seat. He would ride out like Paul Revere, shouting the gospel, doing the Lord's work, a latter-day reverend Jonathan Edwards, preaching to the sinners. A Puritan, warning of an angry God. Nobody listened, but at least they heard him. And because they heard him, they called the sheriff and Officer Dorf would be sent to bring Ralph in to sleep it off. It was a symbiotic relationship. It made old Ralph feel noticed, and it made Officer Dorf feel like a real policeman. You couldn't feel like a real policeman if you didn't get to arrest someone every now and then, and Dorf needed to feel like a real policeman. He needed his big Harley-Davidson Electroglide with the siren and the lights. He needed his spit-shined riding boots and his crash helmet with the department's gold insignia painted on it. He needed his hand-told gun belt loaded down with every conceivable accessory a police officer could possibly desire. From the leather holster to the billy club to the chrome steel handcuffs to speed loaders and to the special police kale flashlights and the utility snap pouches where he carried chewing gum and breath mints. He liked to use the tin code when he spoke on the radio, just like the cops on TV. Despite the fact that there were only four officers on the Crystal Lake Police Force and there wasn't any need to abbreviate everything by using numbers instead of simple phrases in plain English. Dorf dreamed about leaving Crystal Lake and becoming a policeman in a big city like New York or Los Angeles. He felt trapped in Crystal Lake, but his police paraphernalia and his Wyatt Earp attitude helped him to live out his dream at least a little bit. Annie Phillips, on the other hand, had felt trapped by the big city. She needed to get away every chance she got, which was mostly during summer vacations when she took jobs as a cook at various camps. It paid a little more than just being a counselor, and good cooks were always in demand. It gave her a chance to get out into the country and breathe fresh air for a few weeks. She lived for it. She dreamed of leaving the city forever and moving to a log cabin or an A-frame house in the country, perhaps starting a small crafts business or getting a job as a cook in a resort hotel. She and Dorf might had an interesting conversation about the pros and cons of their respective dreams, but Dorf wasn't on hand to welcome her to Crystal Lake when she arrived. He was out cruising the highway, looking for speeders. All Annie had to welcome her as she hiked into town was Ed Bryan's dog Winslow, who watched the pumps for Ed and barked whenever a car pulled in. Since Annie didn't have a car, Winslow decided not to bark. Better to let Ed sleep than risk a sharp rap on the noggin with a rolled-up newspaper for raising a false alarm. Instead, Winslow sat up between the pumps and unfurled his tongue wagging his tail for affection. It worked, and Annie shucked her knapsack and knelt down beside the dog, stroking his fur. Well, hi, you girl. Oh, excuse me, hi, boy. <laughs> she laughed. It was a gorgeous day. The town was quiet and peaceful, about as far removed from the noise of New York City as possible. Hey, can you speak English? She said, laughing and ruffling the dog's fur. Exactly how far is it to Camp Crystal Lake, boy? It was the most attention Winslow had received in months, and he whined in appreciation. That far, huh? Okie dokie. See you later. Annie groaned as she hoisted the backpack onto her shoulders. She had hiked in all the way from the interstate, and had hoped there'd be more traffic around town, so she could hitch a ride to the camp. But there wasn't a car in sight. 
The town looked quite dead. Quite dead indeed. Well, you wanted peace and quiet, she said to herself. I guess you got it. She passed several buildings and turned onto the main street of the town. She saw a number of cars parked in front of a general store and a coffee shop. She decided to take a chance and stop in to ask directions. Perhaps someone would volunteer to drive her. The radio was tuned into an AM station playing Sell Away Tiny Sparrow as she walked in, causing a small bell mounted over the door to tinkle. There were several people in the shop seated at the counter. Small town folks and Older woman dressed in a white uniform with rhinestone glasses stood behind the counter. A couple of New England types in red and black buffalo plaids, jeans, work boots, and trucker's caps perched on the stools. It's 7.01 on Friday the 13th of June, the radio announcer said in that obsequious DJ voice that sounds like a cross between a game show host and Woody the Woodpecker. This is Big Dave, and it's time for you lazy bones to get out of bed. It's Black Cat Day in Crystal Lake. I must have seen that cold track 82 times, the woman behind the counter said to one of the coffee drinkers in response to a comment Annie hadn't heard. A uh, hi, excuse me, she said to be heard over the radio, but the woman behind the counter had turned down the radio at the same moment, so Annie's voice suddenly sounded unnaturally loud. How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake from here? Everyone turned to stare at her. For a moment, she thought perhaps the fly on her jean was unzipped or something because they simply kept staring. But then the woman behind the counter broke the silence. What is it, Enos? she said. About ten miles? About that, replied Enos, a heavy set man in a plaid shirt and baseball cap. Terrific, Annie thought. She didn't relish the thought of hiking another ten miles. Camp Blood, one of the other men said. Don't tell me they're reopening that place up again. Lots of luck, said Enos, shaking his head. Annie sighed, not really following the conversation, just thinking about the ten miles that she had to go. Can I get a bus or something? Not likely, the man who mentioned Camp Blood answered. You're going out to the crossroads, ain't you, Enos? What about giving the little girl a lift? That'll be about halfway, she added, looking at Annie with a smile. No sweat, Trudy, Enos said. He made getting off the stool look like something that required a manly effort. Okay, kid, let's move it. Name's Annie, she said, smiling at him, grateful to have five miles less to walk. All right, Annie, let's go. He walked past her and opened the door holding it for her. All the girls up there are going to look as good as you? <laughs> he laughed. I don't know. A man who looked like a scarecrow wearing a fedora loomed up before them, lifting his palm up towards them. Annie stopped suddenly surprised. The bony hand descended onto her shoulder as the man leaned down close to her face. His breath would have stunned an ox. You're going to Camp Blood, ain't you? He said, glaring at her. It seemed as if any minute he was going to break into a maniacal cackle like the Wicked Witch of the West. God damn it, Ralph, get on out of here. Enos gave him a hard shove. Go on, get! Leave people alone, won't you? You'll never come back alive, cried Ralph, his voice rising in pitch. Oh, shut it, Ralph, Enos said, leading Annie towards his truck. It's got a death curse! Ralph persisted, rolling his eyes wildly. He's a real prophet of doom, ain't he? Enos said, opening the passenger door. Go on, climb on up, miss. He gave her a boost with a hand on her rear as she climbed up. For a moment, Annie wondered if he was copping a quick feel, but she decided to forget it. He seemed reasonably harmless like crazy old Ralph, and it probably made his day. In any case, it beat walking ten miles. He went around the front of the truck and climbed in, turned the key, and started the engine. I tell you, he said as he banged the shift lever into first with noisy grinding. He's causing problems enough for your boss with all that talk. The truck shuddered out of the parking lot with a sloppy clutch engagement. Goddamn nuisance, Enos muttered. 
They drove in silence for several minutes as the truck left town and headed into the country, over a small bridge and onto the country road. Enos seemed to be wrapped up in thought, and Annie just stared out the window. "'He tell you anything?' Enos asked and turned, her eyebrows raised. "'What?' "'He tell you anything?' "'Who?' "'Your boss, uh, Steve Christie.' "'Oh,' she smiled. "'Yeah, I'll be cooking for fifty kids and seven staff, including me. "'The campers will mostly be inner-city children.' "'Enos waited a bit, watching the road. "'No,' he said, still not looking at her. "'I mean about what happened.' "'Annie frowned and shrugged. "'No?' "'Enos retreated into silence again. "'She waited for him to complete whatever he had been about to say. "'But he seemed to have thought better of it. "'There was a particular expression on his face. "'Come on,' said Annie. "'There's something you're not telling me.' "'Enos stared out onto the road. "'Then he turned to look at her and said, "'Quit. Just quit now.' "'Annie's jaw dropped open. "'Quit? Why would I want to quit?' Camp Crystal Lake is jinxed, I tell ya. Enos turned back to watch the road. For a moment, she stared at him, astonished. Then she burst out laughing. Oh, terrific, not you too. You sound like your crazy friend back there. Well, maybe, Enos said, scowling. His jaw muscles worked a moment, and he glanced at her, then gazed back at the road. Did Christy tell you about the two kids murdered back in 58? She shook her head. About the boy who drowned back in, uh, 57? She shook her head again. About a bunch of fires they had. Uh, nobody knows who did any of them. And in 1962, they were going to open up again, but the water was bad. He shook his head with resignation. Steve Christie will wind up just like his folks, crazy and broke. He glanced at her to see how she was taking it. Her face was a mixture of polite interest and skepticism. He's been up there for the past year fixing up that place. He must have dropped 25 grand, and for what? Ask anybody. Quit. I can't, said Annie. Enos snorted. <laughs> Dumb kids. Know-it-alls, just like my nieces. Heads full of rocks. Annie laughed and shook her head. You're an American original, she said. I'm an American original, Enos mimicked her. Dumb kid. Annie chuckled. At least I'm not afraid of ghosts. Enos gave up. What was the point? Maybe the kid was right. Maybe he was starting to sound like crazy old Ralph. Maybe they were all afraid of ghosts in the town of Crystal Lake. He wouldn't get anybody to admit that in daylight, but at night, you couldn't pay anybody enough to go anywhere near that place. Call it Camp Crystal Lake, he thought. Call it any damn thing you like. Regrade the road. Give a few coats of fresh paint to the cabins. Do a few repairs on the dock. Fix the boathouse. Put up a nice new sign. It's still Camp Blood. <laughs> Afraid of ghosts? <laughs> to a stranger, it probably did sound crazy. But what happened there had happened after all. Argue with that. He pulled up at the crossroads in front of the cemetery. Far as I go, you be heading that way. He pointed down to the other road. Take care of yourself, kiddo. Annie opened up the door and jumped down lightly. No sweat, thanks for the lift. She dragged her knapsack off the front seat and set it down between her legs, then slammed the door shut. Enos pulled off with a wave, shaking his head sadly. Annie watched him drive off. She hoped he wasn't a typical example of the folks in Crystal Lake. First crazy old Ralph, then paranoid Enos. Sometimes people in small towns were wary of outsiders. Maybe the folks in Crystal Lake were like that, or maybe they just had something personal against the Christie family. In a small town, it didn't take much. News traveled fast. Everybody knew everyone else. It was hard to keep things quiet. It didn't take much for people or places to get a reputation. An unfortunate incident like a drowning could develop into a story of a place that had been jinxed, as Enos had put it. But it had happened. When was it, he had said? 1957? Years ago. Assuming it had already happened, yet he had also said something about a couple of kids being murdered in 58. Steve Christie hadn't said anything about that when he hired her. Not that she should really blame him, even if it had been true. It had been a long time ago, but people had been funny about some things. 
People who were otherwise perfectly sensible could be superstitious about things like that. That's why, if you were trying to sell the house, you didn't tell a prospective buyer someone had been murdered in it. Enos had also mentioned something about fires. Assuming that was true as well, there was probably a perfectly logical explanation for it. Vandalism, for example. Kids fooling around at night in a place that was supposedly haunted. Something like that was always good for a thrill, or maybe some of the locals had taken a hand to make sure that the Christie family didn't get their operation off the ground again. Who knew? Still, perhaps that was something she should ask Steve about. He seemed like a reasonable guy, straightforward and sincere. If any of those things had really happened, there was probably a perfectly good reason why he hadn't mentioned it yet. It might be difficult to get people to work there if they thought the place was jinxed. But if there was a chance that they could expect some trouble from the locals, Annie wanted to know about it. She shrugged and picked up her pack. Now she was getting paranoid. It was that easy. It didn't take much. She started walking down on the road, and soon she had put Enos and Crazy Ralph and their ghost stories out of her mind. It was going to be a good summer. The peaceful, quiet, and beauty of the country. A placid lake, campfires and songs, and who knew? Maybe even a sweet foxy hunk thrown in, and she'd be getting paid for it. Nothing like a couple of months in the woods to get your head straight before you went back to the city and to school, to noise, cold, and pollution, and too many people in too small of a place. One of these days, she would find out just the right place to settle down. But for now, she had nothing more complicated to look forward to than cooking a few meals and kicking back at night to watch the stars or go skinny dipping in the lake. She had walked perhaps two or three miles when she heard the sound of a car coming up behind her. She turned and smiled and stuck out her thumb. It was a jeep, moving quickly down the road. It passed her without slowing down, and she made a wry face. But then the driver hit the brakes and pulled up to the side of the road. She hitched up her pack and ran to the jeep. Things were looking up already. She'd probably catch a ride all the way up to the camp. She opened the door, shrugged out of her pack, and tossed it in the back. Hi, she said smiling at the driver as she got in. I'm going to Camp Crystal Lake. The driver shifted into first and the wheel spun for a moment in the loose dirt on the shoulder, then found traction and the jeep shot forward. I'm going to be on the staff up at the camp, she said, trying to make pleasant conversation. The driver remained silent. Annie shrugged. She knew that small town people didn't talk as much as city people, but there was no harm in trying to be friendly. I guess I have always wanted to work with children, she continued. I hate it when people call them kids. Sounds like little goats. (laughs) She grinned, but no reaction from the driver. Anyway, when you've had a dream as long as I have, I guess you'll do anything, she said. The driver didn't ask about her dream, so Annie just decided to shut up and watch the scenery. It went by at quite a rapid clip. God, she thought. First you get some crazy old coot who tells you that you're going to die. Then you get some paranoid redneck who wants you to quit your job and go back to where you came from, and now the silent treatment. Maybe she shouldn't have said anything about Camp Crystal Lake. Maybe she should have just waited until they got to the road leading to the camp and said, You can let me out right here. Maybe the people in the town of Crystal Lake really did have something against Steve Christie. She decided to be grateful for small favors at least, because she was getting a ride and at the speed they were going they'd be there soon. She wouldn't have to put up with the silent treatment for much longer. They were driving well over the speed limit. She watched the trees whip by, and then a small road leading off on a diagonal with a signpost that said, Camp Crystal Lake. She turned and watched it recede. Hey, wasn't that the road for Camp Crystal Lake back there? She said. No response from the driver. The jeep didn't slow down. She glanced back out the window, then stared at the driver nervously. Uh, think we better stop. Uh, you can let me out right here. The jeep did not slow down. Please, said Annie, starting to feel a little frightened. The jeep sped up. Please stop! The driver didn't even look at her. Please, please stop! Now the driver looked, and Annie panicked at the expression of utter loathing and cold fury in those eyes. She fumbled for the door handle, forgetting all about her backpack, and managed to get the door open. 
The wind whistled past her as she struggled to push it open. They had to be going 60. She jumped. She cried out as she struck the dirt shoulder of the road and rolled down into a ditch. For a moment, she lay stunned, feeling the shock of the impact and the sudden pain shooting up her leg. The tire screeched as the driver hit the brakes. The engine revved as the Jeep was shifted into reverse. Then Annie heard it backing up. She had no idea what the driver was going to do, and she had no intention on waiting around to find out. She struggled to her feet, wincing with pain. Her leg would barely support her. She saw the Jeep approaching quickly, and she turned and limped off into the woods, trying to get out of sight. As she hobbled into the shelter of the trees, she heard the Jeep stop and the door slam. Fear sent adrenaline rushing through her, and she half ran, half stumbled through the bushes, ignoring the branches that had struck her face, not knowing where she was going, just fleeing in directionless panic, trying to put as much distance between herself and her pursuer as possible. She whimpered as she staggered ahead, both from fear and pain, and imagined she had heard crashing through the brush behind her. She tried to speed up and fell, her leg buckling beneath her. She sobbed for breath, biting her lip to keep from crying out. She glanced quickly all around her. Everything was quiet. She was afraid to move, afraid to make the slightest sound. She strained to listen. There, a footstep. Where? Where was it coming from? She had lost all sense of direction. She turned and saw a pair of legs right in front of her. She looked up slowly and saw a knife. No! She whimpered, shaking her head, her eyes wide with fear. Please! Please, no! She backed away, scuttling in the leaves, unable to take her eyes off the keen blade. She came up against a tree. Get up! Her mind screamed. Get up and run! Run! She struggled to her feet, using the tree for support, her breath coming in quick gasps. No! No, please, no! All she could see was the knife shining brightly, coming closer. She screamed and felt a searing white-hot pain as the blade slashed across her throat, opening a deep gash that spouted blood as the knife sliced through her trachea, severing her jugular vein. Then she couldn't scream anymore, as blood filled her lungs and her vision was blurred by a red mist. Okay, Slashaholics, you've just heard an early access upload from the Patreon page. On Patreon, you'll get early access to this book and others to be named in the future, all great slasher novels. All early access titles on Patreon will have weekly chapter uploads that premiere on Patreon two to three weeks before they make it to YouTube. So, if you want to have early access to Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk, head on over to Patreon. Right now, chapters two and three are available automatically to Patreon members. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this book so far. And as always, pleasant dreams!